Welcome back to Bargaining in War. In this lecture, we're going to see how increasing a state's valuation of an object in dispute decreases the circumstances where we observe war. That should strike you as counterintuitive. That's saying that the more a state cares, the less they end up fighting. Or equivalently, the less a state cares, the more they end up fighting. The central mechanism connects back to what we've been exploring in the last few lectures. There, we had uncertainty over the valuation of the good in dispute and took a comparative static on costs. And as we increase cost, we saw that there was an expansion of the peace premium, which caused there to be more war, even though we were making war more inefficient and less attractive. Here, we're flip-flopping things. Instead of having uncertainty over the valuation, we're having uncertainty over costs. And instead of taking a comparative static on costs, we're taking a comparative static on the valuation. Let's get to the game. This is going to be the same sort of binary incomplete information scenario that we've been exploring before. That same three-step process where nature begins by drawing B's cost. And that's going to be either CB prime with probability Q or CB with probability 1 minus Q. And as always, the prime is larger than the non-prime value. So what this is saying is that B knows how many people will die on its side and how many of its buildings are going to be destroyed and so forth in the event of war, and A does not know that information. In the dark, A makes its demand, which is going to be X, some value between zero and one, and the fully informed B sees that demand and then chooses whether to accept or reject. So this is exactly like what we've seen before. The only difference comparing this to the original incomplete information game is that we are trying to take a comparative static on that cost term. And to do it properly, we need to disaggregate what's going on. So rather than just having a value CB as the disutility, it's going to be CB divided by VB. And then we're taking a comparative static on VB meaning that we're seeing what happens when we make B's valuation go a little bit higher. Turns out we don't actually have to resolve this game. It's the same sort of idea what we were exploring in the last few lectures, where all we have is a change in notation. So if we take existing results and then just apply this notation here, we're good to go on the solution of the game, and then we can just turn our attention to the comparative static. So specifically, you may recall that when we did this game, without having the disaggregated cost terms. The equilibrium could be expressed as a function of that prior probability Q that A thinks B has high costs. And specifically, there was this cut point CA plus CB over CA plus CB prime. And if that prior belief Q was greater than that, a would make the risky demand because it was thinking that B likely had high costs, so it could get away with making onerous demands. And if Q was relatively low, then in that case, A would make a safe demand because it thinks that B is likely this low cost type and thus it must be conservative in its demands. So all we need to do to get the same solution for this setup is to note that all we're doing is disaggregating the costs. So instead of having C, we have a C divided by a V. So we just need to stick all of that into here and we'll get our new cut point. Let's just do that right now. Q right here. So let's just take CA divided by VA plus CB divided by VB. All of that divided by CA divided by VA plus CB prime divided by VB. That's it. Still have the risky demand being made here and still have the safe demand being made over here. So great, we're done. We've solved the game. Now it's just a matter of taking the comparative static. So our expectation would be that when we increase this VB value for B, that is saying that B cares more about the stakes, 
makes it tougher, it makes it more resolved. And if we have more resolved opponents, then what our expectation might be is that we would get more war. So this risky demand would be happening more often, which means this cut point would shift to the left. Of course, I previewed that the exact opposite is going to happen. We're actually going to see safer offers being made more often. And the reason, again, is getting at that notion of a peace premium. So think about what that peace premium looks like here. The amount that A must pay the low-cost type to get the low-cost type to accept is 1 minus P minus CB over VB. And if you compare that to the amount A must pay to induce the high-cost type to accept, that's 1 minus P minus CB prime over VB. So the peace premium here is the difference in the two. Well, we distribute that negative. Minus 1 plus P plus CB prime over VB. The 1's cancel, the P's cancel, and we're left with just CB prime over VB minus CB over VB. Well, we can rewrite that as CB prime minus CB over VB. Think about what happens when you make VB very, very, very large. As VB goes to infinity, that peace premium goes to zero. Essentially, the reservation values become exactly identical. So our expectation then, given what we know about peace premiums, is not that the risky demand would be more pervasive, but rather that A would start making the safer demand under more circumstances. So what that means then, when we're trying to write out our comparative static, is that as we increase VB, that increased value should be larger than the cut point before the increase. In other words, if we rewrite out that cut point, CA over VA plus CB over VB divided by CA over VA plus CB prime over VB. When we increase VB by epsilon, we should be shifting it to the right. So the new thing should be greater. So we're gonna to try to look for this relationship here. Plus epsilon, CA over VA plus CB prime over VB plus epsilon. Like before, we're looking at just a single change in the valuation. This is because I want to highlight what's going on with the mechanism. You could think about situations where we're looking at one type of leader being transitioned into another type of leader, and so that's changing just the valuation of B and not changing the valuation of A. But you could also think about some circumstances where we are both looking at a piece of territory and the change in the valuation is that we just discovered oil there. And if we just discovered oil there, then that's going to affect both of our valuations in a positive way. In the textbook in chapter seven, we take a look at what happens in that more complicated scenario when both of those things are increasing at the same time. Here again, though, just to highlight the mechanism, we're only increasing VB by a small amount. We're not increasing VA at all. Okay, so this is going to be a bear, I am sure, as we're multiplying everything out. So let's just go ahead and get to it and be as careful as we can. First thing we should do is get rid of the fractions by cross multiplying. So that's taking this part here and putting it up top here and this part here and putting it up top over there. So let's go ahead and just write that out first. So we have taking the left quantity up top as the numerator, that gets us CA divided by VA plus CB divided by VB times the denominator of the right-hand side. We're not having to flip the inequality because both of the denominators are positive values. So that will make things a little bit simpler for us. CA divided by VA plus CB prime divided by VB plus epsilon. Got to be careful with these primes. Don't want to confuse those. And then we're going to take the numerator on the right side and just rewrite it. 
plus CB. over VB plus epsilon, and then take the denominator from the left-hand side, CA divided by VA plus CB prime divided by VB. Okay, take a deep breath and now start doing some foiling. So take the left terms of each of these. We have a CA and a CA squared, and then we divide that by VA squared. And then take the outer terms. So we have plus CA, CB prime, divided by VA, parentheses, VB plus epsilon. Then take the interior terms. That's CA, CB, divided by VA, VB. And then the outer terms which are CB, CB prime, VB, VB plus epsilon. And that is supposed to be less than, just go with a new line here, do the first terms here, CA squared divided by VA squared, which is good news because you can see that the same thing is appearing right above. Then the outer terms plus CA, CB prime divided by VA, VB. Then do the interior terms, these two. So plus CA, CB divided by, we have a VA and then the dual term there. So VA, VB plus epsilon. And then the final terms, so plus CB, CB prime, divided by VB times VB plus epsilon. Okay, great. So what now? Well, we should first observe that the terms all the way on the left and the terms all the way on the right are exactly identical. So we're good to go there. Excellent. Let's go ahead and just write out everything with those canceled. So we can get it all on one line. Divided by VA, VB plus epsilon. Very careful to make sure we're getting all of the terms correct here. Otherwise we could get something erroneous as our answer. Or even worse, we might be in a situation where we just can't figure out an answer. And then we'll be wondering if it's just ambiguous rather than actually getting a clear answer, which we will get eventually here. CA, CB prime, VA, VB, plus CA, CB, divided by VA, VB, plus epsilon. Okay, we can get this a little bit cleaner. So notice that every numerator has a CA and every denominator has a VA. So we can just divide off the CAs, multiply off the VAs, and then we can further reduce this. Let's just go ahead and take that step now. CB prime divided by VB plus epsilon plus CB divided by VB is less than CB prime divided by VB plus CB divided by VB plus epsilon. Okay, well, it might help if we put these terms in a way that is getting like terms together on one side. So let's try to get the numerators to match each other. So let's move this over here and this over here. And then that way, once the numerators are matched, we can pair them together, and then maybe we can do some more work after that. So what do we get if we move those over? We get CB prime divided by VB plus epsilon minus CB over VB plus epsilon is less than CB prime divided by VB 
minus CB divided by VB. Okay, well, you know, if you know how these fractions work, we can combine them into one on each side. They have like denominators, then you can just treat the numerators as being a part of the same numerator. And when we do that, we then see that we've advanced a little bit further. So notice here now that the numerators match. And if the numerators match, CB prime minus CB, well, if we go all the way back, so keep scrolling, keep scrolling. Remember that CB prime is greater than CB. So this value here in each of the numerators is a positive quantity, which means we can divide both sides by that numerator's value. And if we do that, we're left with one over VB plus epsilon is less than one over VB. Now, if we wanna get rid of those fractions, let's put VB on the other side. That's a positive value, so we don't have to flip the inequality or worry anything about that. We get VB less than VB plus epsilon, and that just simplifies to epsilon greater than zero, and that is true. Thus it is proven. We have now shown, although it took quite a bit of effort as we scroll up, that as you increase B's valuation of the stakes, that increases the circumstances where A wants to make the safe demand because it is shrinking that piece premium. So A is becoming more inclined to make an offer that is guaranteed to be accepted and less willing to take risks. So to recap here, what we've been looking at is the interior solution to this game. And in the interior solution, we see something counterintuitive happening. Well, if we think back to the previous case where we had uncertainty over the valuation and taking the comparative static on the cost, we noted that the inference flipped once we got into the corner solution. So maybe the next thing we should try on this to see how deep this relationship goes is to look into that corner solution. We'll do that next time. Hope you enjoy this and hope to see you then. Take care.